Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Today's video was brought to you by Predictable Revenue's Service LinkedIn Outbound. Find out how we can leverage and grow your existing LinkedIn network to book meetings into your calendar at the link below. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Ethan F. Becker, and we're going to be talking about communication in a virtual environment. So Dr. Ethan Becker is a second-generation executive speech coach and trainer with the Speech Improvement Company. He's a co-author of the international best-selling book, Mastering Communication at Work, How to Lead, Manage, and Influence, which is published worldwide by McGraw-Hill and an Amazon number one bestseller in 13 categories. As a speech coach, Dr. Becker has a pretty impressive list of clients ranging from Harvard University to the New York Giants to the FBI, as well as countless individual executives, politicians, celebrities, and other clients from around the world. Topics for which Dr. Becker brings a unique expertise, topics that he's going to help our listeners out with today, include executive communication, leadership and management communication, persuasion, negotiation, and more. So welcome to the show, Dr. Becker. Thanks, Sarah. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're so welcome. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, a couple of things we're going to cover today are what different cues salespeople can watch for in their communication with prospects and clients in a now virtual world, um, how to persuade an objection handle a video call, and how to balance authenticity and professionalism now that we could all be wearing our pajama pants under the table and no one would even know. Okay, that sounds good to me. Awesome. So, Dr. Becker, you've been coaching executives and salespeople on how to communicate effectively for many years now and to great success. So how do you think communication has changed now that we're all doing it virtually? Well, it's interesting. The, the, it's, it, when we look at communication, you can look at the, the words we use and you can look at the nonverbal communication and the print and written and text and some of the information is just missing in the messages that we normally send. When you're when you're alive in a room with someone, your peripheral vision can see what's happening. <laughs> you're talking to one person, and you can kind of tell the body language of the other people in the room if they're getting bored or or, or not. That's not there. It's not as easy. And in some cases, there's no visual. It's audio only. In other cases, it's a mix. If it's a Technology. If it, if you're using a, a technology that puts each person at the meeting in a square box on your screen, it's also a little bit deceptive. You know, in a live room, I might be a little. If I'm a listener, a prospect of yours, I might be a little bit more relaxed uh, in the room. But on a screen, I'm sitting up straight. I'm making sure I look good on camera, and it's a little bit deceptive. So there's a lot of information that's just missing. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. So for instance, if sales professionals are meeting um, prospects for the first time over Zoom, how can they make sure that they make a great first impression and, and make a meaningful connection with this prospective client in the remote environment if they're used to doing it in, in person? What are your tips there? Yeah, good, good question. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's a lot of ways. There's a lot of ways to approach that. That's why I, you you hear me stalling a little bit because I'm I'm choosing one right now. You know, one way of looking at it. There's an old model known as the human business model, and it's been around a long time. And the idea is that you start a meeting at the on the human side of the equation, then you get down to business. So human, like you might start, hey, great weather we're having today, right? It has nothing to do with the business we're here to talk about. But it's a human thing. The weather, we can all identify with that, right? It's easy to connect with somebody. Then we get what's called down to business, right? And then we get into the business. That sometimes in the middle of our meeting, we go back up to the human. Oh, you have kids? Yeah, me too. Great. Yeah, whatever. Then we get back down to the business, then back up to the human on the way we, uh, when we finish, like have a nice day, for example. Fine. Part of the skill in making connections with folks is figuring out how to navigate that not not doing some fixed staged make sure you make sure you say these three things before you get down to the presentation but it's it's reading the room 
reading the group, in this case, the virtual room. So the, the, the biggest questions around this model that I often, that I hear the most would be what kind of human stuff should I talk about? And then how much of it? How long do I do it? And for those listening today, you may think about this. It, it, you know, there are some cultures, and when I, when I use the term culture, by the way, I'm just defining a group, not, not necessarily a country or ethnicity, but every group has a culture. So the, 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 the IT department has a culture that might be different than the HR department, right? So you got to think about the culture of the group and, and ask yourself, what do, do I think they like a lot of human? Now, sometimes that's by company. Uh, we do work with, uh, with Apple, for instance. And in Apple, in many of the groups and many of the teams, there's a culture that likes a little more human before you get down to the, oh, what does that mean? 10 minutes. You know, there's a one hour meeting and there might be 10 minutes spent. Other groups, even within the same company, even within, no, they want one minute. <laughs> Some groups, nothing. <laughs> so, okay, fine. That's not new stuff there. The question is, what do you do virtually with that? Do people like more or less? And we really don't know for sure. So what can you do? You're on that sales call and you're in that meeting. You got to find out a little bit. We don't have to be perfect. This is not an exact science. You don't have to read minds, but pay attention. You know, if you're there and you follow the lead of the group, if they're all, you're starting the meeting and they're talking about the, the event last week or the weekend, maybe don't be in such a rush to get down to the business. Allow it a little bit. Uh, then you can move down to the business. Versus if you get on the meeting and you throw out the old, did you see the game last night? And they say, yep. Okay, so... Let's dive into the just read, read the virtual room, and you're yeah. going to do fine. You'll make that connection. But it's a nice model to use, human business model to just guide okay. You. That's great. So that's that's how we can kind of take uh, take the lead from the other person within that first meeting, and maybe that's something that we then try to remember or jot down as a note. Like, okay, they're a person that they like that that bit of human, or they like a lot of human. So then how? How that's kind of the first time uh, that you meet a prospect, but for those sales professionals that would have had really long lasting relationships with clients, um, and maybe rely on repeat business and they would like go for a quarterly dinner with uh, a client or something like that, where they would have been able to pick up on all these social and, and cultural, uh, cultural factors over a longer period of time, like, you know, learning that their kid goes to a certain university once you've known them for a couple of years. And then, you know, to bring that up, um, all these things that would be shared when you're getting to know someone in person over many years. Um, so how can you build these kind of meaningful, longer, continued relationships with a client still over video call? Well, some of that is, well, there's, there's one element of that, which is insight in mind. Stay connected. There's, an, um, there's another element to that, which is being respectful of, of a little bit of space. Uh, it, right now, uh, at least during the time of the recording of this, where we're we're sort of knee deep in the COVID stay at home time, uh, many many people that we've been working with have been reporting uh, fatigue, uh, some a term that we use called screen fatigue, where they're just exhausted. There, this this might be your customers, right? For instance, they they wake up, they're on a meeting. It might be you actually too, uh, but you're you're in a meeting. And then as soon as the meeting's over, you're still sitting in the same chair with the same distance to the screen, working on the content from the meeting. Or you go from one meeting to the next and there's no breaks. Boy, aren't people more punctual these days, right? It's like, boom, 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 boom. So as a result, then now here you come. Here you come to sell your product. And they know. They know what you're there for, right? They're tired mentally, physically. Uh, maybe they're distracted from stuff at home. So I would be respectful of that time uh, as you're reaching out, maybe to, to set the appointment, uh, pay attention to that. And then when maybe, here's what you can do specifically, get on the call, it starts, first thing, I mean, maybe some of you do this anyway, but first thing I would ask is, is this still an okay time for us? Uh, it's a very authentic thing. Uh, maybe they don't, maybe, maybe it's just not. They, it was when they scheduled the meeting, but they're just tired, they're exhausted. 
So that that showing of respect is a wonderful way to um, help further the relationship so that when things lighten up, you're the first person that they call. I think that's a really important tip. And, you know, I actually haven't heard that. I know for a lot of sales professionals, they've always done their calls virtually. So they're just used to that being the time scheduled is the right time. But definitely for these companies that used to do it in person, I think that's such a valuable thing to keep in mind. You're so right. Someone maybe would have had two meetings a day because they were driving in between and they had to drive, you know, across the state or across the city or something like that. And now they maybe have 10 back to back. So yeah. yeah got to keep that in mind. And, and maybe it is the right time on the calendar and in the schedule, but mentally they're just not there. And they may, the worst case scenario is that they still do the meeting with you and they look at you <laughs> and they nod and smile, but their mind is not even close to hearing what you have to say. And you just go, you burn through 45 minute presentation. And at the end they say, great, let me think about it. And uh, why don't we set up another meeting? And really, they didn't hear it. I mean, they heard it, but they didn't really hear it. Right? So that kind of a check-in, and sometimes that's painful. You know, if you've been really working hard to get a meeting with somebody and they say, you know something, this actually, can we do the reschedule? <clears throat> Those are times to, to really show respect. And, and that's, that's what, that's what ch changes somebody from an authentic sales professional to someone who's just going through the motions because they were told to. Yeah, that makes sense. So in the vein of screen fatigue, um, this is how you can be respectful uh, considering other people's screen fatigue. How do, we, how do we balance our own screen fatigue? How can we combat our own screen fatigue as the salesperson? That is a, that's a, I love that question because a lot of times we are so focused on sales on what can we do to, to influence the other person. Uh, in the world we live in, the psychology of the speaker is incredibly important. So I love your question. What can we do to manage our own screen fatigue? Okay, well, the first, probably the most obvious thing is take breaks. Uh, if you can, try to schedule your meetings for 55 minutes, not an hour, uh, which will, which uh, will uh, give you that extra five minutes. Sometimes it's, it's easier to end a meeting five minutes early than it is to schedule a meeting five minutes past the hour. So end a little bit early if you can, if you can. Uh, and when you can, and when you do, make sure to stand up and leave your workstation. Walk into the other room, take a step outside if you can, go sit on the couch, even if it's literally 60 seconds. It creates these little breaks that if you think about it, normally you get these breaks when you're walking to the car or going to the restroom or in one meeting to the next meeting or the water cooler. We don't get them very often. And then we just book meetings back to back or they're booked for us. So you got to take those breaks, change your focal length if you can. <clears throat> that's a, that's not an easy one, but that's something that you should do. And do you think that uh, screen fatigue in, in the salesperson or the person trying to do this effective communication. Do you think screen fatigue has an impact on the way that you can kind of converse with somebody else or in, in the way that you, I don't know, and maybe like the speed that you can respond to things or, or how do you think it'll impact you if you are really fatigued? Yeah, without a doubt, it affects us. <clears throat> think of it like this. <clears throat> In general American English, the average person speaks at a rate of approximately 183 words per minute. That's the average rate of speech. If you were just to go to a meeting and start counting words, you get to about 183, a little more, a little bit less, depending on who you're talking with. We can think at like 600 words per minute. <clears throat> That's the speed of thought. We can think that fast. So that means there's like 400 or so words a minute doing other things all the time. Even right now while I'm talking and people are hearing and listening to me in the back of their minds, they may be sitting there thinking, oh, I got to get that email out. Oh, what's, you know, uh, what's going on with this or that thing that, that's in front of them? Fine. That extra 400 words a minute, we use it. We're used to using it for all sorts of things. In fact, really skilled sales professionals are using that extra 400 words a minute, whether they know it or not, 
to look at all sorts of things. Or who's listening? Who's bored? Do I need to skip the demo? Do, you know, is it, do I go for the close now? You know, always be closing, I know. But like, they're, they're processing that. With screen fatigue, that is strained. The result of which is it becomes more difficult to read all of this other stuff, not to mention some of it's not even there because it's on a screen. We don't see yeah. people live. So it's exhausting. It is exhausting to pay attention. And then maybe add into the mix a particular customer who's really boring, <laughs> who's, who's <laughs> trying to <clears throat> articulate their needs and you already figured out what their needs were on the first word <laughs> when they open their mouth, but they're going on for five or 10 minutes and you're exhausted, right? It's really tiring. So yeah. being proactive, a good night's sleep before a big meeting, eat right. That sounds a little bit boring, but boy, it has an effect. Nutrition, of course it affects us. Nutrition. I mean, you are what you eat. So you know, pay attention to that stuff. And then take breaks. Take breaks when you can. For your actual sales meetings, if you can maybe give yourself 15 or 30 minutes in between, like you might normally do if it was a uh, drive, like you were right. saying earlier, Sarah. Right. That's another really interesting perspective because I think as we've moved virtually, there's been a lot of um, talk about kind of self-care and, and wellness at home. And usually talking about giving yourself breaks and that kind of thing was more for a kind of a health benefit. It was like, yeah. you're going to exhaust yourself, um, make sure that you stay healthy, make sure you take those breaks. But I don't think I've heard of it from this perspective of like, no, you're actually going to be less impactful or you're going to be less effective at at kind of keeping all of these things that are usually active in the back of your mind and being able to employ them as you need. It's, it's pretty, a pretty interesting take. I think that you're, you're going to be yeah. worse at your job <laughs> if you don't take these breaks. Absolutely. I mean, we, we often hear the term road warriors for, for those reps that live out on the plane. Are they living on the wings? Uh, you know, they're not flying everywhere or driving everywhere. And, you know, physically, uh, those of you who do this, you know, you take a lot of abuse. The body gets beaten up. Time zone changes. Eating sometimes is constrained by whatever fast food restaurant is nearby. They, but you just do it. You just kind of bear. But, you know, you have these natural breaks. We don't have that. And at home, in addition to all of these things we're talking about, there's another strain in the psychology of the, of the person talking, selling. It's called cognitive dissonance. The concept of competing ideas in the mind. And when, when cognitive dissonance was first sort of theorized, it was really focused on how can, how can military soldiers do bad things, hurtful things they, their personal views don't like, but their superior is telling them to do. But okay, fast forward to today and put it into the context of a business meeting, <laughs> cognitive dissonance. Here I am sitting in my home office, which might be the laundry room, you know, you can't see it, but you know, I, I know I'm, in, I'm squeezed in this space. I'm on, the camera's on. I'm in my either my meeting at work or with a customer. And one message in my mind says, "Be professional. Don't lose the sale. Use my training and all of that stuff." And at the exact same time, I can maybe hear the kids fighting in the next room. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I need to go handle this. It's about to explode. <laughs> I need, but I need to be here, but I need to be there, but I'm here. I'm there and I'm torn. And, and even, even when it's, even when it's, uh, you know, the cat comes into the picture and we have a wonderful boss who says, oh, that's cute. Or I don't mind your kids or I may not want to share that part of my life with my work colleagues. I don't have a choice. I'm here anyway, right? Suck it up and keep going. So we do, but that cognitive dissonance puts a tremendous strain. Strain mm. fatigue, I'm tired. Maybe I've been alone for a while. It's not easy. Now, there are, and you may note it, and this is not just gloom and doom. I don't mean to be all negative. I, what I'm trying to do is explain if anyone's been experiencing it, normal. Mm. It's, it's normal stuff. It's not, there are times when we are sharp as a tack. Some of your folks may, may, may feel this, where there are moments you're just in the zone. You could, you, you, could, you could be out on your deck and you're in the zone. You're in the basement. You're in the zone. There are times where you feel it. So if you want more of that, take breaks, pay attention to your, to your, uh, um, your body and your food. It'll make a difference. 
Awesome. That makes a lot of sense. Um, kind of back to keep an eye out for these social cues that are now different. We're not reading the room, we're reading the virtual room. Um, another thing that would rely really heavily on being able to read those cues is a salesperson's ability to persuade. Um, so in what way do you think persuasion has been kind of crippled in the COVID environment? So, you know, we, we train sales teams all over the world. Uh, we coach uh, sometimes the best of the best on sales teams, not just those who are brand new or green or who need it. And in all of these cases, when we discuss persuasion, we like to talk about it in its original form over 2,000 years ago. It's not a gimmick. It's not like, a, oh, it's a thing. It's a, over 2,000 years ago, Aristotle first introduced the idea of persuasion. And it's studied, to, even today, if you go to school today to study speech communication, you will study Aristotle's theories of persuasion, or what he refers to as the modes of persuasion. And there are only three. And this may sound familiar to some of your listeners who's, who've worked with us before, but I'll tell you what they are, and then how these translate. The first one is the Greek term ethos, which is the idea that you will be persuaded through means of one's credibility, your reputation, who you are, what's your ethos, what's your credibility. And in some cases, we get that for free. You know, they don't even know you. You give them a name card, a business card, and they, and it says, you know, vice president. Ooh, like, now if next to that, there's a company logo, that's a really bad company. Okay, now your ethos, it drops, right? So we have, our companies have ethos that we borrow as a representative, and that's either good or bad. So ethos is a relative thing. Whether it is good or bad will depend on who you're talking with and how they view things. The classic example would be when, if you are quoting uh, research or data in your sales presentation, well, who are you quoting? If you're quoting uh, McKinsey, according to McKinsey, if your listeners and your prospects don't consider McKinsey to be a credible company, then your entire presentation just went into the gutter, right? So you need to think about what is, this is the question you want to know, what is my ethos and then how do I communicate it? Now, as you think about that, what's your ethos? It's not always where you went to school or how long you've been working. It could just, your ethos could be on how you prepared for the meeting. Over the last couple of days, I was looking through your company's statistics, right? Or did you talk with people? That's your ethos. Well, I appreciate you seeing me today, and thank you for putting me in touch with Tom and Stephanie. They were very helpful. What is the ethos? You should know it, uh, not just the company's ethos. Sometimes it, I mean, you, gotta, you play with this stuff. And then how do you communicate it? Do you say it out loud? Do you not need to say it out loud because it's in a printed piece of collateral, right? I mean, these are the questions you look at. What is it and how do I communicate it? Uh, the second one, I'll come back to this in a minute, but the second one is the Greek term pathos, which is the idea that you will be persuaded through means of emotion, some emotional channel, excitement, fear, enthusiasm, right? Whatever the emotion is, very powerful. And the third one is the Greek term logos, which is the idea that you'll be persuaded through logic. For instance, statistics or data. So what Aristotle was saying is that there's ethos, pathos, and logos in everything. It's in the, the, the physical space that you're in. And uh, for those of you who've been out in the field, there's a difference sometimes when you go to meet a prospect, when they say, yes, we're meeting up here in the boardroom versus we're meeting here in this tiny little room in the basement, right? There's, it's in the physical space. It's in the topic. Certain topics have a certain ethos, pathos, and logos about them. It's in you. It's in what you look like. It is in the way that you sound. So it's not a question of, do I use the ethos thing? Ethan talked about. It has nothing to do with me. The question is, what do you do? What can you do about the fact that it is already there? Can you use it? Can you pay attention to it? Can you match what you're saying with the way that you're saying it so that the quality of messaging is strong? Now, in a virtual environment, 
what is my ethos? Now that's a little different than just in addition to, I've been at the company for so many years or whatever, that kind of stuff. It's maybe what you look like. Okay, so you're in your basement, you're in your laundry room. What can you do? One of the things we've been coaching a lot of teams most recently on is are things like your camera framing, your lighting that you have to work with. And you don't have to be a professional television production person to have a professional presence uh, on the frame, on the camera. Uh, the sound is a little more work because you, you, you may or may not need to order a special microphone. But most built-in cameras are fine if you know how to frame it properly. Things like that speak to the ethos. Nobody wants to buy something from somebody when they're, all you see is the eyes at the bottom of the frame and, and you know up the nose and stuff like that. It's like, you got to learn some of these things. Right. So there's a whole bunch on persuasion. <laughs> awesome. Fun. So, and I think along the same vein as persuasion for salespeople in particular would be objection handling. Um, how do you think, how can you read objections and how you should handle them again, now that we're missing all of these kind of external cues? Yeah. I, uh, well, we won't, I'm not going to go into teaching objection handling here. Sure. Um, we do a lot of that kind of work. But many of your folks maybe have already gone through some trainings with it. Whatever technique you're using, fine. What, what I would say is going to help you to do it well is what we would call really strong facilitating techniques, meaning the, the meeting facilitation has got to be good uh, because, because it's harder to read body language. A good facilitator will make sure you are on time, make sure that, that you are um, asking for feedback and questions. Uh, even that, good facilitators don't just say, okay, so uh, any questions? Uh, let me stop. Anybody have any questions? Listen to the tone in my voice. All right, any questions? I mean, just the sound of my voice makes you not want to raise your hand. It takes you right back to school. You know, what, what did we learn in high school? If you have a question, all right, all right. So that's the assignment. Any, any questions? I mean, now the teachers really do want you to ask questions, but everyone in that class is like, I'm not going to ask a question. So the way you do that, that's a facilitation technique. Listen to the difference. Option A and option B. Option A. Okay, any questions? Option B. Okay, I'd like to pause here. This is a really good time for questions. What are some of the things you've been thinking about in the past few minutes? Right. No, I'm, I'm a little softer in option B. I'm authentically inviting it. That's a facilitator's technique. Now, why is this important? Because when they ask the question, well, now I get to hear the objection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't get to hear it before because on Zoom and GoToMeeting and uh, WebEx or whichever tools that you're using, only one person can talk at a time. So th that typically tends to be the loud people in the group and then the quiet ones, who might actually be the influencer on that, on that prospect, they never get a chance to speak up. So you need strong facilitating technique, and you'll do just fine. Then you right. can use your standard uh, techniques with objections. And if you don't have any, call us. We'll come to you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And we'll share with all of you where you can find uh, these guys, how you can, you can get all these tips if you want more on any particular subject. Um, so that's great. So you're almost inviting inviting objections rather than waiting for them to pop up and hoping that they do you've got yes. to invite them you've got to create the space for them to be mentioned yeah and the more authentically you can do that the more real it is you know the the it's so funny because there's a lot of like sales methodologies that are taught out there we study all of them i mean for us we study every month our whole team gathers every month for a full day of development globally we all log on to the remote meeting and we spend an entire day and we look at the latest research on these things and debate it uh, and, and so forth. And a lot of the philosophies and methods are almost identical. They, they just have different cute names and nicknames about how you do things and so forth. But all what they do, if you think about all of the different methodologies, these are folks who have looked at really good, talented sales professionals and started taking notes. Ooh, what did they do? Ooh, look what they did. And then they wrote a book out of it. <laughs> it's like, so whichever approach you're using for handling objections or, uh, or raising your game with selling, you got to be authentic with it. Now, it may not feel comfortable at first because you may be 
even just asking people, do you have any questions? Uh, you know, it, it, this is a good time. It could feel very uncomfortable for folks. That's where practice comes in. Speech and communication is a behavior, just like a sport, throwing a ball is a behavior. And at the beginning, it might be uncomfortable, but you got to practice it. And then it becomes second nature. Same thing with selling. The more you do it, the more you practice it, uh, and the better you get. And then it becomes authentic because it is, it should be, it should be. Great. So let's dig more into this, uh, into this finding your own authentic methodology and kind of finding what your ethos is. So you mentioned you guys study all of the different uh, sales methodologies. People, salespeople may have moved from company to company where they study these different methodologies. Maybe they go out and do their own research and follow thought leaders, uh, read books, that kind of thing. How can, um, and, and you were the one who phrased it like this when we chatted before, but like a surgeon, how can you cut out all of the different pieces of all of these different methodologies to, to piece them together into your own authentic methodology? Well, the more you do, the better you'll get. That's, that's for sure. Uh, and, and don't be afraid to screw it up. And we're not perfect. I don't think there is a read this book, do these three steps, and you'll close every sale. Like, really? Come on. Like, if somebody's advertising that, I'd be very careful. There could be some truth to the techniques, but, but there's a lot of trial and error. And what we, we work with a lot of very high-end, very, very talented sales professionals, and they will be the first people to tell you the number of no's <laughs> that they've gone through. And so part of it is being resilient. When something does not work, be honest with yourself. Did it not work because the technique is bad? Did it not work because it's a good technique, but you stink at it? Did it not work because it's a good technique, you're good at it, but the other person had a bad day? Sometimes we don't know these things until we do it again and again. Now, that's great if you have a lot of sales calls, but what if you're sitting home alone <laughs> and you just started the job and you yeah. have nobody on your docket? Practice alone. Uh, well, you, you can always practice with a coach. That's why that's what we do, right? But you can also practice with a peer. That's that would be the next best thing. Somebody else in the company, maybe a mentor who's been there before. Uh, or if you're if I'll tell you this, this is hard, this is the hard one. Let's say you are a senior level sales professional. You've been selling for 20 something plus more years, and you've been at the top of your game, and now you're in a new company. And you're seeing folks maybe younger than you, sell more than you. Be humble in your confidence. Be humble in your confidence and you'll do fine. It's okay to go to one of those other people and say, hey, let's practice together. And just own it if you're kind of lousy at it. Because you know what's going to happen. Eventually, you'll catch your bearings with the new product, the new position. And then all those years of experience of reading people get put right back to use and you will be soaring. But don't worry if it takes you some time and it's a little embarrassing. It doesn't mean you're at the beginning of the end of your life career. It's just a new job. It's natural. So own it. Own the mistakes. And that's okay. And then over time, you'll do just fine. That confidence you had when you were at the top of your game will come right back to you. Awesome. And I think a similar... Uh, kind of approach would work for these people that are starting their sales career totally from from the beginning, but now virtually, as you mentioned, work with peers if you don't have a bunch of sales calls under your belt. Um, but what are some other ways that a sales professional who's now starting their career totally virtually, who doesn't have the experience in real life, doesn't have the experience learning a, a few different sales methodologies? How can you build your kind of credible, authentic sales methodology if you've never had the in-person experience? Well, the good news is you, you don't have to build a whole methodology, right? I mean, there's, there's so many out there that, <laughs> it's funny, they're not really that different. I said it earlier, but they're not really that different. So pick one. I don't really care which one it is. Uh, and use that as a baseline. There might be some parts to it where you think, oh, this doesn't fit me. Okay. You know, but talk to a mentor about it. Uh, as, you, as you figure that out, talk to other people in the company who have been successful and ask them about what they do. Ask them about their approach. And you'll find some people who say, I use the such and such method. And you'll have other people that say, no, I don't use any of that. I just do X. 
mapping is kind of the same thing. They just didn't call it, they didn't give it a name. <laughs> but what you'll benefit from is learning and listening and hearing from that. Then you got to practice. You've got to practice. And you can practice by yourself. You just, just record yourself. With Zoom, for example, with, actually, with all of the tools, go to meeting, you can log into a meeting alone and just hit the record button and then go through the sales presentation. You do need to know your company. You need to know the product comp inside and out. You got to know that stuff. Uh, there are a lot of folks who will come in in sales and they're good at selling, but they don't really know the product. So they depend on the product specialist to do the product demonstration. I'm fine. I'm not like, I'm not going on a tangent against that. I get that. But, you know, the, I can tell you this, the most successful salespeople really understand the service or product that they're selling. And if you're new in the company, don't let that intimidate you. You're new. It's going to take some time. Watch people, watch recordings of people, and practice. Practice alone. Record yourself practicing alone, and then get feedback. Give the video. Beg somebody at the company. Could you please watch this and tell me what you think? honestly what you think. You'll get it. You'll get it. Folks in sales tend to be more direct with each other That's than true. other departments in a company sometimes. I think this is really, really vital because I'm thinking back, I only started my sales career about a year and a half ago. And I'm thinking back to all the ways that I learned about the product, how I came to know it inside and out, how I figured out all the different ways that we should objection handle and, and what was going to come up frequently. I learned most of that because I was sitting in the same room as the rest of my team and I was overhearing the account executives, how they talked on the closing calls, which positioned me better to talk about it on these kind of prospect calls. Um, so you're right. You've got to kind of take the bull by the horns and you've got to do this yourself. You're not going to have that opportunity. So these were some great examples of how to do it. I'll say what you can practice, like for objection handling, for instance, there are moments in the objection handling process where we are paying extra careful attention to uh, for example, confirming that the, the prospect understands our response, um, questioning about making sure we actually understand the objection before we do anything else. So if you're recording yourself practicing, that, that will, with that, you need a friend. You need a friend. I mean, you, like I said, use coaches is what we do. But if, if you're not, if your company doesn't do that kind of thing, get a friend and just tell them what you're doing. Say, would you practice with me? Pretend to be this kind of a customer. Uh, and then, and see, and on top of whatever you may have learned or read, now add ethos, pathos, and logos. And so it's not, it's more than just <laughs> the, the sort of nowadays obnoxious. So um, if this is so, if this, if you're okay with this, does, if I tell you this, will it mean you're okay to move forward with the sale? Like those pressuring techniques. What's more powerful than that is matching the ethos, pathos, and logos. If your customer is a very big pathos person and you're placing all of your persuasive argument on the logos and the data, you're not likely to make the sale. Uh, if they are a logos person, and you're, and you're all about hugging, which you can't do virtually at all anymore, and smiles and talking about the ball game, but they're a logos person, you're missing the connection there. And that may be uncomfortable. If you're a pathos person, you love talking about the game, right? But they're a logos person, you may need to practice saying things. What does that mean? Maybe you're going through the same content, but you're not as excited when you get to certain things. Versus if you need more pathos, you got to show that, right? These are the things that we really focus in on, on what we call sales communication training. What do I sound like when I'm saying these things and look like? So with, with Zoom and, and online and virtual go-to meetings, you can, uh, you can see it now, but it may take a little bit more practice and, and more pausing to allow for the customer to respond confirm that you understand they're responding, that kind of stuff. Really, that'll make a big impact. Very interesting. I think one of the kind of key takeaways of everything we discussed today is the, the, those, those three uh, persuasion techniques. Aristotle had it down 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Don't mess with something that yeah. works. Don't reinvent the wheel. <laughs> well, you know, we talk about it. Uh, I'll give time to do a book promo. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so my book is called Mastering Communication at Work, How to Lead, Manage, and influence. 
And uh, a lot of sales professionals read it. It's very, very, it's an international bestseller. It's been an Amazon number one in 13 categories. Uh, we're doing a revision this year, which is very exciting. And, um, and I highly recommend it. There's an excellent chapter on persuasion and also motivating. So if your customers are not going and you need to, many people say you can't motivate someone else, but you can speak to the motivation within. Uh, and we know enough about the psychology of how people think to do that. And it's not so hard. Uh, the other thing I'll just mention real quick here is that we last year we launched an app for people who like this kind of stuff. It's it's for iPhone only right now. Sorry, um, it uh, it's called Speech Companion. That's the name of it, and it's got a nice review of ethos, pathos, and logos, and a bunch of other selling tips and suggestions. We we designed it really as a free tool for our clients as a supplement to things they're learning. But even if you're not working with us, there's a lot in there you probably would benefit from. Yeah, that's amazing. We'll make sure to include the link both to find mm -hmm. the book and to find that app for everyone to see. And uh, if you are going to buy the book on Amazon, please leave a review. That's very yes. helpful to, to Dr. Becker and his co-writers. Um, as you mentioned, it's already a, a top seller in 13 categories, so that's pretty amazing. It obviously has great reviews, so let's, let's get some more of those in there and help other people who would find it useful see it. Um, yeah, this has been a really, really interesting conversation covering the different communication techniques that are now vital in this newly virtual environment for so many uh, different salespeople and executives as well. Um, we kind of covered different cues to watch out for when communicating with prospects and, and with clients, um, persuasion and objection handling and, and kind of those three, Aristotle's three persuasion uh, modes. Those are really, really vital. And as you mentioned, you can read more about those in the book. Um, and then we talked about the balance of kind of home life and, and professionalism and, and how to navigate the two. So this has been a really interesting conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Becker, for coming on the show. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, where can they find you? Uh, the website, speechimprovement.com. Speech Improvement uh, is, is uh, where you can find us if you want us to do training or coaching or just you have questions. Uh, also, LinkedIn. I'm, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn a little bit uh, more than other social media sites. So feel free to find me there. And uh, you can just ask questions if you want. And, and we'll take it from there. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching the latest episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast. All right. Shout out to Predictable Revenue's Service LinkedIn Outbound service for sponsoring this video. As a founder and sales leader myself, I, I know most of the best practices in terms of like what I need to be doing on LinkedIn, um, but sometimes I just don't have the time. Um, you know what the right things to do are, but it just... It comes down to a trade-off of what's what's a better where where's my time better spent, um, and can I find somebody to do to click around on LinkedIn for me and book meetings, you know, and then I can focus on higher level activities. Um, and so think about it: what's the best use of your time? If you're a founder, sales leader, and you have a team, you need some meetings. I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, I'm using it myself. I'm obviously the founder, so eating our own dog food. Um, but if you're curious, click the link below to learn more. Mm -hmm.